Ray and um, several other people are, you know, starting to put the pieces together. And it's something quite special, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, if you have time, do you want to get to your final topic? Yeah. So uh, that question you asked me last week. Yeah, I asked you a question last week and you just piggybacked on mine. So you said you had your own. Yeah. The question was, I like the word that you used. What's the most scandalous thing that I believe theologically or wrestling with theologically? Yeah. And I said faith and works. And we had a discussion about that. Yeah. Um. So hit me with it. You actually sort of referenced this earlier. Um, so I, I got some notes. Oh, no. up. I don't lose track. Do what? I said, oh, no. <laughs> I'm always scared when someone tells me, hey, you said this thing that one time. And I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't know what I said. Yeah, that's fair. I do the same thing, especially when it comes to stuff like this. I'm like, oh, how much did I how much did I say that I say too much? Um, but so. One thing that I think is so interesting about the way we Christians talk about the Bible is uh, we use a lot of big words like uh, word of God and authoritative and inerrant. And Someone still needs to tell me what we mean by word of God when we speak of the Bible. That's very true. Very like, Give me a, a concrete definition of something. what you mean when you say that. I know, I know. Um, and I think, and so what I'm going to poke at here is sort of related to that. Um, I think, you know, word of God, most people, when someone says the word of God, most people think they mean inerrant, authoritative, perfect in all regard, fell out of the sky as a fully formed leather bound golden ink book that, you know, cannot be examined in any way. Um, and that I think is an entirely useless and counterproductive way to look at scripture. Um, so I'm going to specifically point at or poke at the concept of inerrancy. Because you mentioned this earlier and when you said it, I was like, ooh, this would be a good time for a segue, but. Oh yeah, baby, let's do um, it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I equally want to get your perspective on this, but I have some notes that I'd like to try to make my way through because yeah, I think. Go ahead, go ahead. Make having a conversation. some of your notes, and then we'll we'll yeah. bounce off. But like riff off of me if there's something you want to say. Okay. Um. So one problem that I have with inerrancy is that we have different <laughs> textual variants that exist historically, and so textual criticism and not criticism in the like we're criticizing criticism in the sense that we're thinking critically. Right. Mm -hmm. Thinking critically about the textual variants that we have is something that I think is very important for every Christian to do, mm -hmm. at least a little bit. Um, if you're the type of person that is OK with living with that sort of thing, that's cool. But you at least need to know what you think about this topic. Um, and I think you should be well enough informed about it to make a decent decision. Um, so we have. I think I was quoted the stat. Um, 54,000 different variants of the New Testament mm -hmm. and not a single one of them 100% agree entirely. Um, now, most of When we say variant, what do you mean? So we have 54,000 texts. Not whole text of the whole New Testament. Whole text, to be clear. I believe that's of the, of the whole thing. And really? I think. Okay. Um, don't quote me on that, but we have a lot of them, okay? We have like yeah. a significant amount. and The most of any ancient text ever. Yes, the most of any ancient text ever, um, but not a single one of them agree, right? Mm -hmm. Now, they don't disagree a lot, right? And because we have so many of them, we can generally speaking piece together something that we think is some semblance of the original or close to it. But what's interesting, you know, you think, okay, some people have made some mistakes in copying this down, right? That's where we get the variance. That, that is, accounts for a large portion of the variance, but not all of it. Some of those are very conscious decisions that people are making to change for theological reasons. Um, now, that's something that is a whole nother conversation. Um, but that is a fact, and that exists. Um, again, I believe the example that is probably easiest to wrap your head around is um, sometimes it's 
uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's something like, let me see if I can remember it properly. Um, Father, Blood, and Holy Sacrament or something like that. Um, so like, it sounds a little weird and is very, very different. And, you know, which one's first, why was the change made, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, again, that's not my area of expertise, at least as of yet. And so I won't get into it, but we need to recognize that those things do exist and that we have to do something with that. Mm -hmm. Um, another problem that I have with this is the, um, sola scriptura. When, when I say that, what do you think? Well, literally in scripture alone. Yeah. So scripture alone. So one of the five solas of Martin Luther. Yeah. What, um, where, where, where we go with that? What does that mean? Uh, everything we need is in scripture. It's on the, how, what we need to understand God and ourselves is found in the pages of scripture. Okay. And that's all that we need. That would probably be the operative phrase. Yes. And so what I just spent the last however long doing explaining the marriage meta narrative in scripture using cultural context would be under that standard, absolutely useless, right? And counterproductive because context, if scripture alone, if you want to hold that super strictly, right? Like a lot of people want to hold that super strictly. If you hold that super strictly, uh, plain reading, as your Calvinist would, friends would say, probably a plain reading, um, everything that Bema does, everything that Ray Vanderlaan does, everything that I just spent however long, an hour, whatever, doing isn't God ordained, useful, or holy in any way. And so I, I firmly believe that we need some form of context to better inform our interpretation. Um, A lot of, I think, cultural corruption causes bad interpretation um, Mm -hmm. or loss of cultural understanding causes bad interpretation that then causes a lot of bad things in the world. Um, And that can be a discussion for another time. Um, Yeah, because to just make your point a little bit further, take a minute or so. Yeah. We're all conversion and culture all the time yeah right this is this is even why so with certain friends i can talk about movies and like i i am educated about film through youtube like i have a youtube education in film criticism yeah which is fine because there's some great people out there doing it but my point is there are certain friends that i have where i will not even venture into that topic with them because yeah. they just don't know. They aren't aware of the context of which I'm going to be talking about this specific thing, yeah. right? So, and then there's other friends where that's all we talk about. Yeah. You could say, and I would maybe say, that those friendships have a different culture. Well, now it's very small in its difference, but there's a different cultural context. Mm-hmm. Then, or to use a phrase that John Walton likes to use, which I love, uh, we each have our own cultural rivers. Yeah. So, like, while they might not be that different, right? There are certain things which I can't bring up with certain people, which I can with others, mm-hmm. that I just won't or can because of the context with which I'm in, yeah. where people will understand what I'm saying, right? Missionaries go through this all the time. Oh, well, I can't tell you how many times it is my family will sit down and we'll like talk with other ex missionaries or current missionaries and they'll always be like, oh my gosh, it's so good to talk to someone who knows what it's like. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? You mean someone who has A, gone through similar life experience than you, most likely. Yeah. Um, and B, has a similar outlook than you, most likely. And C has a certain like this is a Christian Christianity at large, but in missionary like things more specifically, there's lingos, there's abbreviations, there's things we say. My dorm, sorry, this is getting a little bit long. My dorm in high school. So like I went to a missionary kid boarding school. Yeah. You want to talk about cultural context? 
you needed cultural context for the dormitory like house you were standing in to understand yes. things that we were saying words yes. that we were using why yeah. because for a bunch of mk kids were like i had a bunch of south koreans who went to my school there were some like british kids that went to my school there was me there was like a bunch of american kids yeah. there was some local uh kenyan like kids who went to my school wide variety of cultures and ethnicities went to my school yeah what we did was we literally took all our languages and Swahili, and we made up words. We had we literally had our own words, and the words that in Swahili meant something could mean something different depending on how you elongated the word. Wow. You needed so much cultural context to sit at the dinner table, yeah, or the cafeteria table with me and my friends from Mbega. Yeah. Literally, people from other dorms were like. Oh, you're speaking like you're from Ambega. Like literally knew the terms that came out of my dorm. That's hilarious. Like there was so the Swa I'll, I'll use an example. So there's a Swahili word it's kadogo. And it mean I think it means a little, I believe it means a little bit, or how we use we so we we coined the <laughs> we coined the phrase kidogs. And it would be like a little bit. But it would change depending on how you, again, you elongated the syllables. So if I would say, if like, talk, let's say someone came back from basketball practice or whatever, say I came back from basketball practice yeah. and I had a coach my junior year that made us run every day before practice, mile and a half. Yeah. And someone from a dorm asked me, hey, so Byler, how was, how was that run? How was that run before practice? And I'd be like, oh man, that was key dogs long, right? Like. I'm saying it was really long, even though kidogs literally means a little bit. Yeah. Right. You need so much context to understand what that sentence means. Yeah. So e I mean, even if you have some context, you're still going to misinterpret it because you you're using the term sarcastically. Yes. And so it's like you you have to know first what the term means, then you have to know what the term means to you, then you have to know how you're employing the term. So yeah, it, it's this is so why that scene about language and arrival is so genius. Yeah. By yes. the way. Yeah. But I'm anyway, watch the movie again. But yes, so context is like to make the point. Like we deal with it all the time in our own lives. Yeah. And and everything we read, right? Yeah. Why, like, okay, so like *Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas* up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this next is one of the books next on my reading list. Yeah. That, like, oh, no, I'll use a better example. I'll use a way better example. So Great Gatsby, favorite book of all time. Written in 1925. One of the, probably the best American author ever. If you don't know anything about the 1920s, that book is lost on you. Yeah. So we understand this with great fiction. Yeah. With movies. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't watch Parasite the same way I watch um, Inception. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we not do this with the Bible is basically what I'm getting at. Like, yeah. why do we not understand this? It's the same way in every other context, whether it be art or personal experience. Yeah. Well, and I think it comes down to the, the implications of Sola Scriptura, right? Is because we've had this theological label plastered on how we should think about it and how we should approach it it is then trickled down to a very flawed view of what it is we're supposed to do. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Go, go back to inerrancy real quick though. Give, give a couple points on that. Cause you, so a, a couple more. Uh, yeah. I don't, yeah. Well, solo scriptura and like cultural context was baked into your thing about inerrancy. And then you gave the textual criticisms of, uh, like the variants of the documents that we have. What about the text itself? And I, I mean, we can talk about Masoretic versus Septuagint. There's some very interesting things going on there. I sent you some videos about that earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any examples of, so like one that I've heard, here's, here's my rough, if you want my just rough, like two minute take on inerrancy yeah. and why I have a problem with it or why I think it's maybe a useless argument to have. Yeah. Authoritative. I'll quote my buddy, John, authoritative. Yes, definitely. Inerrant, 
Hell no. Why? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, we have to talk about is it the Masoretic or the Septuagint? Because mm-hmm. there's different, like, as we talked about in Deuteronomy 32, yes. sons of God, sons of Israel. That makes a huge difference sure does. in how you look at the rest of the Old Testament. Yeah. That one word. Yeah. So is if it's sons of Israel, sons of God, I think it's sons of God. But you could argue, well, it's inerrant. So like, what? but then I'm like, which one are you picking? Yeah. Right. So there's yeah, a technical yeah. difference that so many people don't understand is like, is it the ancient Jewish Masoretic text or is it the Septuagint text yeah. that was all Greek? Right. So language, we're already letting someone translate the text for us at some level. Okay. Um don't even get me started on the translation. Oh, that's a whole nother. You know what? I'll go there if, if you got time. Yeah, no, I got time as long as you got time. Okay. Um, I will make one more. Like I made this point last week when we had a discussion. Yeah. Matthew's literally changing words mm-hmm. in yeah. the yeah. Septuagint copy that he probably knows in his head because he hasn't memorized because he's a good yeah. Jew. And or No, he's not a good Jew. Yes, he was. He was a tax collector who was. Yes. Yes. So the joke still, the joke and the point still stand. Um, Matthew probably has something of that in his head as yeah. he's writing his gospel. And he says, no, I'm literally changing this Greek word to mean exorcism and not bring forth because I want to make a theological point in this thing. Yeah. This biography that I'm writing about the life of Jesus. Yeah. Right. Um Another example I used earlier was like Paul talking about the rock in the desert. Yeah. It was never assumed that no one ever said that was Jesus. The, the major assumption was that it was the same rock yeah. just narratively. Yeah. So like also here's my other thing. This is fun. Uh, this is a fun one to bring up. Peter and Jude. I'm not saying that this book is meant to be in the canon or anything, but Peter and Jude, as part of their cultural context, as part of the dialogue they're having in their books, yeah, are quoting Enoch. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So you have parts they're of they're quoting Enoch. Enoch for ideas and like whole, yeah, is as verses, yeah. So like, what? Do, so is Enoch? So if Enoch, let's follow this logic. So if the scripture is all that we need, and the scripture is inerrant, and the scripture references things outside of itself as authoritative, right? Paul does this at uh, um, Mars Hill. He, yeah. Right? Yeah. And we live and move and have our yeah. being. That's not scripture. Yeah. That's philosophy. Yeah. Um, then like, what do we do with these? Cause if you want to hold like, I think the Christian should be the most open handed with truth in the sense that it can come from anywhere. Why? Because if I believe in a God that's created this world that loves human beings, I think he's going to, like, we're going to see him everywhere, whether we see him in full pictures or not. You can argue we never will. Yeah. Like, people are going to be pointing to these true things across time and across culture and across religion. Yeah. So, like, I should be able to say, look, that the, uh, the symbol of the, the Tao symbol, the the what's it called the like white and black with the spots in the middle oh, yeah. um okay. the yin and the yang symbol the Taoist symbol the yin and the yang for the taoist i think because it has a t in there yeah. is like true it's a true representation of like experience in life it's not because it's a christian yeah it's true so yeah so that so like my take is well inerrancy we have to pick it translation and then you get in trouble because then there's yeah, obvious well, errors in another one and then and, right, you both have textual variants within the strain and so then you have to pick you know which variant and maybe some variants of one strain are good and maybe some variants of the other strain are good and so then you got to try to figure i mean it's super complicated it gets super complicated super quickly um but one thing that you know that made me think of too right is the problem with translations in general um, so there's a Hebrew term that I love using for this example, um, hevel. Mm-hmm. Do, do you know the term? Mm-hmm. So it's the um, phrase that's used in Ecclesiastes. It gets it gets translated meaningless, but that's not really what it means. 
Yeah. So it means it can mean vanity, which is how it's typically translated. You know, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Yeah. Um, it can mean vaporous. Mm -hmm. It can mean empty. It can mean false. It can mean idle. So it has, you know, four or five meanings all wrapped up in one term. And the translator has to pick exactly which one of these meanings they're going to pick when translating to English. Well, now imagine you multiply that by several thousand, several hundred thousand, right? Because every, almost every single word in Hebrew is like that. And so every single time you read a translation, the translator is making active decisions about what aspects of the word that is there in the Hebrew that translator is going to show you. Now, that is a decision that has to be made when you're doing a translation that is inherent in it. And there are some very good people who do that. But then there are some very good people or some very bad people who don't do it very well and who are theologically motivated, um, I believe, and translate things away that should be left in. So that's, that's a rather large problem, um, I think. And I could give some examples of that, but that, that'd be a whole nother long conversation. So based off of this, my general assessment is anytime someone who isn't very well educated in Greek or Hebrew is reading a passage, you should attempt to read it in at least two, if not three or four different translations, because that will likely give you a more holistic interpretation of what the original language was saying. And that doesn't have to be done if you're just casually reading, but if you're trying to do a deep in-depth study you need to be a bit more intentional about that yeah and here's something else that this is you know free resources on the internet that i will give for people who 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 want to do that kind of thing. something my mom does yeah sometimes um something i found myself doing quite a bit um because i haven't yet paid for the logos bible software is i will use blue letter, blue letter bible blue letter bible i use it if you ever so if you're ever reading a passage and you think hmm that phrase or that word choice is really interesting. I've seen that a couple other times in this book or in these few chapters. I wonder why that's used. Yeah. Uh, you can get on Blue Letter Bible. You can look up your passage, mm -hmm. click on the verse. It'll bring up an interlinear text of the Hebrew corresponding to the English translations. And then you can click on the Strong's number mm -hmm. that, is given for whatever Hebrew word or phrase you're trying to look at. And then it will link you to a page that gives you every instance of that word in the specific translation yeah. in the text. Yeah. Or every instance of that Hebrew word in the text in its corresponding English translation. Yeah. Then what you can do, this might sound boring to you or it's very interesting depending on what you're studying. You can read all the instances of that word being used and gather context yep. right because what the example i just gave of me being in boarding school well if you were around us enough if you heard the context that we use these words and you'd get what we were saying yep. but if you just dropped in for 10 seconds and heard my response to my friend about basketball practice you would have no idea what i was referring to yeah well and th that goes to a greater point right is that scholars have reconstructed these ancient languages off of that technique, right? They've had to recognize and adjust the definitions of words depending on how they've seen them used in certain contexts. And sometimes maybe biblical Hebrew isn't quite as good an example for this, but you get Ugaritic or Akkadian or things like that, languages that died off and we didn't have anyone carrying them on for quite some time in any religious function or anything else that's the only way we're able to determine a definition of a word. We could be totally missing the boat and we just don't know. We're pretty sure, but we just don't know, right? And so context in, in which words and phrases are used is super important. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great point. Here's, I have one question. Yeah. If you have time. Yeah. It's I've on got more things that I'd like to try to hit, but yeah, go for okay. it. This is on the subject of inerrancy. Are you, are you talking about hit things within this topic or? Uh, yeah, in, within inerrancy, yeah. Okay, here's, so this might hit on one. Yeah. We actually studied inerrancy in my Old Testament class um, a few, probably three weeks ago. Yeah. And we're studying God, like scripture or the word of God. And then and inevitably we talked about inerrancy. 
one of the things that kept being brought up in my class was inerrancy with, now we just discussed this a little bit, but within the canonized original documents that we have. So I guess what, how would we or you answer that question of what about not even inerrancy with an English translation? Because I know that that's a whole other subject of having to translate. Yeah. But inerrancy, God's intended message was, this is not even necessarily. See, all right, so let's back. I think, I think I'll give what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? But I'm also like, this is something that Heiser said that's really interesting when he, he has a little portion on inerrancy. And he says, well, it gets kind of tricky because everybody can define an error in different ways. Um, and, and this, what you define as inerrant, tells you or the person you're talking to a lot about how you think about inspiration. Mm-hmm. Right. And maybe that's what we can get to here in a second. Yeah. But I guess what would be your answer to that? And then this is going to tell us a lot about what we think about inspiration. Yeah. So I do think that the Bible is inspired, at least in part. Now, there are parts of the Bible. Um, I believe in one of Paul's letters, um, he's writing to Timothy and he says, Mm -hmm. this is not the word of God. This is my advice to you as a now, within the can't like if we hold this thing up and say everything in here is inspired, well, Paul openly admitted that that wasn't. So, which I've heard that said at church before. Yeah. So, so like, <laughs> what what do we do with that, right? Because not the, this book is admitting that not everything in the book. The authors of the book were telling you that not everything in it were divinely inspired. So that's sort of interesting, right? Um, I I do think that. Um, if not the parts that weren't divinely inspired, I do think are divinely appointed. Okay. And I think that's a good distinction to make, right? I mean, I've, I thus far and can plan to continue to devote my life to studying this thing. I treat it as seriously as anyone else out there. And I love this thing super deeply. And it's because I love this thing super deeply that I want to treat it with the utmost respect and um, give it, the attention it deserves and warrants. Um, so part of the problem, I think with the original question you asked is that we don't have an original like at all. Um, we're, we're at least a few hundred years off in all accounts. And so um, if not more off than that. So within that few hundred years, we have variants that have developed. And so it's hard to tell what the original was, right? So it's, I don't want to say it's a bad question. It's just not, it doesn't necessarily deal with the facts as we have them now. Um, And a great way to say it's just a stupid question. Well, no, it, (laughs) it, it, it doesn't like practically, I can't do anything. Yeah, no, no, no I know I what you're saying. The question, exactly. You know what I mean? But I think it's an important question to ask because of that reason. Um, because a lot of people would, Got it. So you could ask, you know, you could say to me, oh, well, what about the original, you know, Hebrew text that we have? And then the response would be, well, those don't, or what do you mean by original, right? Um, Then you get into kind of a word game, but then the point could be, we actually don't have one unified original text. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of people like to quote, I believe it's the passage in second Timothy, where Paul says all scripture is God breathed. Yeah. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Paul wasn't talking about his letters or any of the gospels that hadn't been written yet. Yeah. Right. And so he, he was talking about the Hebrew Bible that wasn't even officially canonized for several hundred years later, like final canon, final canon. Um, so again, that gets kind of complicated. Um, but while it might be complicated, I do think that there is divine value and divine appointment on what we have and it is very useful and it is very good um, and it is very complex and to say anything other than it is complex or to try to say that it is not complex is just disingenuous and a complete falsification of everything that we know yeah so does, does that answer the question yeah no definitely definitely answers the question uh, so I guess I'll go on to my last few points and try to make them quick. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to try and pull so, something up real quick while you're getting that. 
Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about in context to the whole inerrancy thing is the way in which it leads us to idolize scripture and how we almost turn the Bible into an idol. Does that make sense? Yes. No, I've, I've definitely seen this happen a lot. Um, and in fact, I think this is something that I personally struggle with. Like I've said, I love this thing so, so much. But if I love this thing instead of loving God, then I think I've missed the point. And I've fallen trapped to that in my life through different seasons. And it's something that I have to actively fight against. I mean, even now I'm in school and I study this thing all the time. And so it's very easy for me to say, oh, well, I've had my God time today because I spent X amount of hours working on a paper and studying the text, right? And so it's, it becomes very easy for me to let myself off the hook for not having prayed like I should, not having been intentional and in my spiritual practices like I should, mm -hmm. because this thing can easily become an idol. Um, and that I think is something that a lot of Christians fall prey to. Um, and another thing is that we have to, and I may have mentioned this last time we talked, but um, we have to recognize that all language is provisional and can never capture the true intensity of something, especially something as big as God. Um, we can only speak about God in metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. And metaphor inherently like in its nature is inadequate in mm -hmm. defining something, at least in the Western sense. And so um that's why I think the Eastern perspective is so useful and so beneficial when, when it comes to studying this. But it's also good to recognize that God is not literally a fortress. God is not literally a shepherd, but God is like a shepherd. God is like a fortress. Um, God is like an all-consuming fire. God is like these things. Um, and so we can sort of see the ways that that interacts. Um, I feel like a lot of that was, you know, deconstruction, but if we're going to try to reconstruct something from this, I think that what all of that analysis should produce in us about this idea of inerrancy is humility and a willingness to trust others. Yeah. So humility in the sense that we don't know everything and we know that we don't know everything and we should act that out and then a willingness to trust others. And, you know, I think it was Peterson's, ninth rule was it that uh, assume that the person you're talking to knows something that you don't Correct. Um, assume that the people who were in, who were writing this and who would be reading this first knew something that you don't and assume that the, the people you're talking to about this know something about it or about other things that you don't. Um, and that should help yeah. us be a bit more um, willing to, to wrestle through these things in an active way. I feel like we intellectualize and conceptualize a lot of the things we, we see in there, uh, like the fruit of the spirit, for instance, like, oh, love, joy, peace, patience, yada, yada, yada. And all that's well and good, but patience is something that's hard, you know? And so to actually like, we like to leave it as these, you know, ethereal thoughts that are good to crochet on pillows, but when, when it comes to being patient, you know, patience is only something you can practice when you don't want to be patient. Yeah. That's when it counts. And so, I don't know. I just kind of got off on a tangent there. But um, anyway, I digress. That would be my response to your, your question. What is my scandalous view? It, it's all of that. And probably a little bit more. Well, it's great because we share that one as well. Oh, yeah, like I've I said, had, I've had fights with people about in inerrancy. Oh, really? Yeah. Not literally. Not like bad, but just yeah. People who hold it who never really thought about it yeah. necessarily yeah. in a like critical way, mm -hmm. as in like what is. 
what does it say in the text and what about the text and yeah you know so because i think that the there's actually a great pete ends podcast episode called the the problem with an inerrant bible mm-hmm. and they talk about this and i think for many people the fear this this was very much a problem um in the 19 again talk about the 1920 1925 um i think i quoted gatsby as being written in 25 that's not probably not true um i don't know exactly when it was published but uh i do know scopes monkey trot happened in 1925 yeah. and that was if you look at i actually wrote a paper on this uh last semester as and i and i and i called it the scopes monkey trial and the loss of and the loss of imagination and fundamentalism. Um, I think you were telling me about this. Which uh, I stole that phrase, although she didn't put it in fundamentalism, she put it in evangelicalism, which I think they've also, well, we, because I'm still one of us, yeah. uh, lost a little bit of Im- imagination. But anyway, yeah. um, one of the things that was a big concern for people around that time as um, Darwinian thought was taking hold as evolutionary thought was taking hold, as liberal theology from Germany was taking hold in America, was that the once you gave way to an inerrant Bible, you would then not believe in the divinity of Jesus would be the ultimate. Yeah. Um, then you know you wouldn't believe in a fall, or you wouldn't believe in God. Yeah. You would right, and you wouldn't then ultimately believe in Jesus. That was the fear. Well, that's I don't a think slippery slope fallacy right there. Yeah, I know. And I don't think that what what either of us are prescribing here as problems with inerrancy will lead us to. Yeah. But part of this is also you deal with the text in context. And in like I said this in my first Genesis video, right? I'm not going to read a biography of Lewis the same way I read the Chronicles of Narnia. That would be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't approach those texts in the same manner, the same yeah. way. I don't approach Genesis, you know, six, the same way I approach um, John three, right? Yeah. It's just different. It's different literature. Genesis six, I would say, is um, mythical history, yeah. uh, and then John three is biographical account of Jesus' life. Uh, it's a little more than that, but. You, you get the idea, right? These are totally different sects of literature. So therefore I read them differently. Yeah. So I think that that slippery soap fallacy just falls apart. If you're someone who's diligent in understanding the type of literature you're reading, mm-hmm. um, right? You don't read a poem the same way you read a screenplay. Yeah. You know, the same, same rules apply. Yeah. Um, it requires some level of interpretive skill. Yeah. It just does. And I think part of the issue is we haven't taught, we haven't actually taught people in church interpretive skill like that. Yep, I agree. We might we might mention it, but it actually doesn't then get taught in how we teach about it. Yeah, well, that comes back to reconstruction too, right? We've done a bunch of tearing things down, but I mean, one practical thing that people could can do to address these issues and that I've tried to do is develop interpretive skills. I used to think wisdom literature was super dry. I spent an entire semester in that and the prophets. And those are pretty intense interpretive skills that are required to do a decent job of reading those texts. Mm -hmm. But it's worth it once you get through it. It really is. Yeah. Isn't there a uh, talk about reconstruction? Here, I'm going to youtuber real quick it's not, it's not a video i want to show anybody um but it's uh i think the bible project has a whole series on literature genres yeah or i think it's called literary styles yeah um there's a video on literary styles in the bible um there's a whole series on how to read the bible mm-hmm. design patterns in the bible plot yeah. in the bible um plot i've listened to one of theirs on plot and yeah so podcasts so these newer ones um there was an older series that did called read scripture which tim famously said it was like getting a second doctorate degree to make those um sure. they went through every book of the bible pulling themes and separating them into sections and yeah all of that 
Um, but yes, if and I will link it down in the description of the podcast or the YouTube video that's made, uh, the Bible Project series, How to Read the Bible, yeah. talks about a lot of these different literary styles and how they interlink and intertwine and what the nature of the text then, to use a phrase we've been talking about, would be. Yeah. Um, and those are some great, great resources to help yeah. educate yourself on, okay, so I don't want to just read the Bible as yeah. one thing all the time because it's not. So how do I do that? Well, you got to educate yourself. And, you know, there's hope. Thankfully, there's great resources out there to help yeah. people do that. Um, yeah. And I was going to talk, give another point of inspiration, but I can wait to do that next time. Because um, I have an interesting tie in how that works with how we talk about artistic inspiration. Yeah. Well, inspiration might be a whole nother conversation that we can have. Yeah. So we can talk, we'll talk about our scandalous views of inspiration next week. There we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, Dan, it's been a pleasure, a real pleasure. Getting this Dog, that would be me. She said, let's go to Hong Kong, but I'm only 18. Ain't got money for Hong Kong. If she'd have asked me last year, I'd have been long gone. Cause we all dogs and I hope we all go to heaven.